Welcome to Building Hope and Fighting Disease, a program presented on behalf of the Smiley Jamaat Kanan Center's virtual series. My name is Benoush and I serve as a member for communications and outreach on the Smiley Council for the Southeastern United States. The Smiley Jamaat Kanads are more than places of worship and spiritual search. These spaces hope to encourage community engagement, to broaden our intellectual horizons and foster an appreciation of pluralism. Let's talk about fear. Fear, an unpleasant emotion. Many would argue that fear is a central factor in preventing progress. There is fear of impoverishment, fear of nature, and in our current situation, fear of illness and uncertainty. In 2006, upon receiving the Tolerance Award at the Tutsing Evangelical Academy, His Highness the Aga Khan said, and I quote, if animosities are born out of fear, then confident generosity is born out of hope, unquote. He went on to explain that even in isolated communities, conflict can be turned around by giving people reasons to work together for a better future essentially reasons to hope. The Carter Center was established in 1982 to wage peace, build hope, and fight disease. They've worked in over 80 countries to prevent conflicts, to protect human rights, to advance democracy, and fight disease. I'd now like to introduce to you the moderator for this program, Murad Karimi. Murad also serves on the Board of Counselors for the Carter Center. Welcome, Murad. Thank you, Benoush. I'm delighted to introduce everyone to Mr. Jason Carter. Jason is the chairman of the Carter Center Board of Trustees, which oversees the center's work advancing peace and health across the globe. He previously served in the United States Peace Corps in South Africa. He still speaks Siswati and Zulu, though he claims he is getting rusty. Jason has been named to the Georgia Trends list of 100 most influential Georgians and has consistently been recognized as a rising star in Atlanta Magazine, a listing of the top up and coming attorneys in Georgia. As part of his legal career, he has represented civil rights groups and others in defending against attacks on voting rights here in Georgia. And he is a frequent speaker on the importance of protecting the right to vote. In addition to his work at the Carter Center, Mr. Carter serves on the boards of a number of civic organizations in the Atlanta area, including Hands On Atlanta and the Women's Resource Center to End Domestic Violence. Jason attended Duke University and the University of Georgia School of Law. Welcome, Jason. Thank you for joining our virtual programming series. Thank you, Murad. It's great to see you, and I'm honored to be here. Excellent, excellent. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll jump right in. Go ahead. I would like to... I would like to begin this conversation by asking you to please enlighten our listeners on the mission of the Carter Center and how it was founded. Sure. Thank you for the question. And again, I'm honored to be here uh, with you and and with this entire community. Um, These are strange days, as you know, and I'm in my house. And if if people hear my dogs or my children, I'm sure that won't be unusual for those of us who are now getting used to this new virtual reality. Um, The Carter Center was founded after my grandfather, as he says, uh, was involuntarily retired from the White House in 1980. And it was originally set up to be a place uh, for people around the world to come to to make peace, building on my my grandfather's uh, great success with respect to the Camp David Accords between Egypt and and Israel. Um, And as it grew, uh, based on his strong belief in human rights, It became uh, broadly defined an an organization that is uh, devoted to alleviating human suffering and, as as was mentioned earlier, building hope. And so today it operates in two general spheres, peace and health. And the way we think of human rights is that uh, it is as broadly defined as we can to to be able to be free from, for example, preventable disease, in addition to the types of human rights that we talk about in terms of freedom of, of speech and, and association and the right to vote and the right to live in a, in, in a vibrant democracy. So we worked in many countries. Our primary goal is to do things that no one else uh, will do. So we fill gaps and we go to the places that are beyond the end of the road. 
as much as we can. So we find our programs in Southern Chad, uh, in South Sudan, in, in, in Mali, in the, the hinterlands of, of uh, Venezuela and, and Brazil, places where it's very difficult to get and places where others uh, have been unsuccessful in, in their work. And so uh, we try to fill gaps. We try to, to do tough tasks. Um, and we try to do them with that spirit of, uh, of human rights and the belief that people can make a difference in their own lives if they're given the tools and the resources that they need. Excellent. Thank you for that background. Given you all are working in you know, some remote, very complex, complicated areas of the world, do you leverage partners in working on the ground in these areas or do you typically get it alone? And if you're working with partners, how do you engage with your partners on the ground? Sure. So we do a number of things, right? Where our peace programs include a democracy and human rights programs where we are working almost exclusively with partners on the ground. Um, in those places where we are dealing with access to information or we're dealing with uh, just protecting human rights defenders, there we are engaged sort of hand in hand with the people who are fighting for human rights in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, or Liberia. Um, in addition, on the health side, uh, we also work directly with ministries of health in many of these countries, for example, South Sudan, Sudan, Ethiopia, um, uh, Nigeria, and others. We are have been working with those ministries for many, many years um, on river blindness prevention, on the eradication of guinea worm disease, on control of trachoma. And as we do that, we, we, we leverage our uh, work um, through those local organizations. And one of the things that I think is most important about the center, whether it's based on democracy or frankly, whether it's based on uh, fighting disease, if you're going to be in a community, the best way to tackle these problems is to be part of that community. And that means that when you go into a village in Mali, uh, you don't see that as a place to send pity. You see that as a place that has real power. And the goal is to come in, work with those people, um, not at those people, to make sure that they can make these changes in their own communities. Excellent. No, that's, that's nice. Thank you. Um, you know, next topic would be a little bit on faith and spirituality. Your grandfather is a man of faith. Um, how would you say this has influenced his life's work? How is the spirituality really shown through in the Carter Center's mission? And you know, I, I, thanks for the question, Murad. I, I think, you know, my grandfather truly is motivated by his faith. Um, and, you know, one way to think of that is, is in, in, in my religion, we say that all people are created in the image of God. And what that means then is that in every single person is that divine uh, being that that. And if you if you internalize that, you know, another way in, in my religion, again, we grew up Christian in my religion, we would say that uh, one of Jesus's great uh, commandments is to love your neighbor as yourself um, and as the fundamental commandment. Um, that he provides. So what, what, what that manifests itself for my grandfather, I think in his life, number one, he wants to do as much as he can with what he's been given. And he knows that he has this enormous platform as a former president of the United States, um, as an American, as someone who people look to, uh, to make a difference in people's lives. And he wants to use his moments on this earth to do that. But also it's about that sense of what I would call human rights or respect for dignity it's to know based on our faith that when you interact with another human being, you're interacting with uh, an image of God. You're interacting with someone who has the, the greatest dignity um, and, and that, that spiritual being uh, that, that you want to reach out and ensure that they get what they need. So when you see somebody you know, sleeping under a newspaper, um, you know, that's the image of God. When you see somebody who has uh, you know, beset with a number of diseases in the middle of nowhere, that person doesn't have less value because they're poor or less value because they live in a place that doesn't have resources um, or because they live in a place that, that is unhealthy. In fact, they have just as much value in our goal um, as we worship really is to go out and do what we can in the world um, to, to manifest that, that understanding of who we are in relation to God. And I think that that is something uh, that has driven my grandfather throughout his entire life. Moving on, our, our topic for this program is building hope and fighting disease. The Carter Center's tagline is waging peace, fighting disease, building hope. How do these three interplay with each other in alleviating hum human suffering? Sure. As, as, as I mentioned earlier, Murad, um, the Carter Center looks at 
at, at what it takes uh, for someone to sort of achieve the, 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 the dignity that we all aspire to. And, and in our view, when we looked out at the world, certainly when my grandfather began the center, there was a series, uh, he knew he wanted to focus on human rights. Um, and so when we think of human rights in this country you, and around the world in many ways, we think of perhaps the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights that identifies uh, you know, the, the rights to, to freedom of the press, the right to information, the right to, to coalesce and have political rights, the freedom of speech, um, you know, those, those freedoms that, that we think about. But also um, we look at it and we do spend a huge proportion of our resources on um, observing elections to ensure that they have credibility, on ensuring that people have access to information and, and ensuring that people who are defending human rights in different countries uh, have the kind of support that they need, sometimes in the face of authoritarian regimes or, or, or conflict that's putting their lives and, and safety at risk. But we also looked at, at the health side of human rights. And as we uh, looked out, certainly 20, 20 or 30 years ago, there was a huge number of diseases that they call neglected tropical diseases. And those neglected tropical diseases were in fact neglected. And so they were rampaging in many senses uh, throughout the poorest parts of the world without um, sort of the, the, the great resource parts of the world paying any attention to them. Um, and today, one of those examples is malaria. Um, but there was a number of other diseases um, that that were that the Carter Center believed, based on its relationship with the CDC and a number of others, that we could tackle. And one of those is about uh, guinea worm disease, which is going to become very soon the second human disease ever eradicated. And what's remarkable about that, and my apologies for giving a long answer, but I'm coming to the hope part. Um, the remarkable thing about the guinea worm eradication program is that in 1986, there were three and a half million cases. This year so far, there have been six human cases of guinea worm disease. So we are on the verge of eliminating it from the face of the earth. And what we have left behind in all of the villages in Chad and Mali and Nigeria and Ghana, and in, 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 in where there's no longer guinea worm disease, what there is, is a group of people who participated in a public health campaign and made a giant change in their own community and the world. And those people and the empowerment that they feel from having ended this ancient health scourge is, a, is, is not just uh, a success for the guinea worm eradication program, but it builds the type of hope and the type of, of understanding of their ability to change their communities that we think uh, will lead to many, many other, not just health benefits, um, but other, um, to your point, uh, examples of hope and, 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 and dignity and an understanding of what they can become in their own communities. Excellent, thank you. The Carter Center is committed to improving the quality of life of people by advancing human rights. What role does civil society have in strengthening human rights in communities around the world, as well as in the United States? Well, you know, civil society, Murad, is the backbone of a democracy. It's the backbone of, of our communities. An organization like this one here, where people are organized together and connected with each other, um, that's the foundation on which we build all of the coalitions that make up our government and all of the, the, the real ways that we express ourselves in, in, our, in our communities and in our democracies. But one of the things that the Carter Center has spent a great amount of time on um, is, is an election observation. And as really, uh, we have observed more than 100 elections in troubled democracies around the world uh, over time in order to help bring credibility to that process. And the, one of the fundamental uh, tenets of that observation is that in, in civil society, again, when, when decisions come from a community instead of from outsiders coming in, uh, you have a much healthier and much better understanding of, of how things operate. So when we'll go into a country, we only go if we're invited, but there we, we always spend our time working with civil society, seeing them and, and, and understanding what it is that they do and what an election is for us. It's really just a report card on the quality of a democracy, right? The question is how much access do marginalized people have to the political process? How much uh, does, you know, how, how vibrant is the press? how vibrant and how, uh, how free are people to engage in the political process without fear of retribution. Those things all manifest themselves in an election. The other things that manifest themselves are the kind of racial polarization that you see in many countries, including our own. And, and as those things come up, one of the key 
uh, building blocks of democracy is what role the organizations in civil society play in safeguarding those rights and in expressing those rights. So as we look out at the world um, in hundreds, as I said, of, of different democratic elections, we see that, that, that that's one of the keystones in this country. Um, what's happening right now um, is we have seen that we are deeply divided, that this country has uh, a, a, a remarkable uh, moment where you've got people coming together to deal with age old issues, um, but you've also got real questions about the credibility of our electoral system. So if if we were looking at this from the outside, we might say that this is a country uh, where it needs the Carter Center to come observe the election, but uh, we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Now, to that point, how high do you sort of estimate the risk to be in this country for the for the next election cycle? Well, I mean, you know, this is a this is an important moment, I, I think. And, and, you know, your question about civil society is a crucial one. You know, I think people feel in this country very alienated from each other uh, based on political lines. Right. I, I think the, the Trump and his supporters uh, feel like they're under attack from all sides uh, and that they have very little in common with people uh, who are out in, in the streets protesting. Uh, for Black Lives Matter movement and, and against the kind of racial injustice that has, you know, uh, besmirched this country uh, since its founding. And so and though that level of alienation is, is an important uh, and, you know, relatively concerning thing. The other thing that's concerning is as people have a giant amount of mistrust on the two sides, the crucial thing is for the, act, the electoral process. Um, to work really well. And so if people start to question the validity of the electoral process and question the, um, the, the ability to uh, accept the results, you start to have real problems. But the, the, the point that I think is important for, for us in this country is our institutions are very strong. Our civil society is very strong. Um, our court system is very strong. And even as people believe the courts have been politicized in, in different ways, I think you've seen just in the last week, um, some surprising decisions out of the more, quote, conservative members of the Supreme Court that demonstrate their commitment to the republic and to ensuring that no president or, or group of people gets too far out of line. So I think that while this is an important moment for our democracy and while there's a real set of division and concern out there and we have a huge number of issues that we need to work through, I think our civil society institutions and our other institutions are very, very strong. And so I think this country's democracy is going to be incredibly healthy. It's just going through a moment right now um, of, of, of some pain and, and I hope growth. We appreciate that assurance, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you know, moving on a little bit here. In, in 2015, his Highness the Aga Khan delivered the keynote address at the Athens Democracy Forum on the International Day of Democracy. He suggested four elements that could help strengthen democracy's effectiveness in improving the quality of its constituents' lives. They are improved constitutional understanding, independent and pluralistic media, the potential of civil society, and a genuine democratic ethic. What are yours and the center's views on these four elements? So I, I think those four pillars are can really be seen as what we've been discussing and how the Carter Center um, approaches a lot of these issues, sort of uh, from a constitutional understanding standpoint, the more that people understand their system and how their system operates and how it is that they uh, can use that system to sort of maximize their power, you know, those are the uh, fundamental, that's the fundamental information on which political power is based. And so making sure that people have that is a way to sort of expand that and democratize uh, power in, in, in a country. And, and, and I think really give people hope on the, on the side that when they make a, a choice, it can make a difference in their own life and in their country. I think the, the other aspects of that with respect to civil society um, and, and uh, an understanding of uh, a de true democratic ethic, I think those things are, are about what's in, you know, the civil society side is about community and about uh, groups of people that, that can get together, can come together, can, can pursue common interests. And I think that that democratic ethic is about that belief in the value of our common pursuits, right? The belief that at the end of the day, uh, we are, we are uh, all connected. You know, and I think we, these some of these issues have been driven home for us now. Uh, many people now in, in, in my country understand that if uh, if someone in a faraway city is the victim of, of a, a race based crime, uh, you know, or police brutality based in the same context that they're denied justice there. It matters to me in my life. 
you know, if, if someone gets sick uh, all the way across the world in Wuhan, China, it can make a difference in our life, right? The idea that we're fundamentally connected instead of fundamentally separate is one of those things that drives all of those different pillars uh, that he mentioned. Of course, the pluralistic media, um, it being the fourth pillar, is another of those items that just that helps people to see and understand their connection and to see the pluralistic aspect of that media helps them to see and understand the connections that they have with people who are otherwise different, right? So to me, a democracy and those fundamental pillars comes back to this idea that we are fundamentally connected and that each person has a, ro a role and a right uh, to participate. Be and if you deny that, that, that role and that right, then what you're doing is you're undermining your, your democracy for everyone. So that, that's the kind of thing that we look at. I think that, that speech and those four pillars are ones that, that are, are common uh, for many democracies around the world. And I think that that democratic ethic that shows that we have faith in the value of our common pursuits um, is the one that to me is the most important and the others kind of support that idea of, of, of giving each person a voice and recognizing the value of each of those voices of others. With respect to media, how do you, if you were to grade the, the media in this country, do you think they do a good job in helping the general public think around issues or are they maybe a bit sensationalist and trying to draw how, how would you view so I, I think you're, I think you're asking a question. Recommend. Yeah. Sorry, Murad, go ahead. I, I missed that last bit. No, no. How would you How would you grade them? And if any suggestions for you know if there are any media executives listening? Um, yeah. Sure. So I, I think that one of the one of the real questions is what's the media, right? Are there media executives still? Uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, I mean, that's a joke, but I mean, you know, one of the things that has really transformed democracy and the way that people interact. Um, and in many ways has become, has, has provided the ability to connect, but in, all, in many other ways it has provided the ability to, to, to um, highlight differences is, this, is social media and the way that people now connect and the way that people get their news has been transformed so much. And one of the Carter Center's newest and I think most important programs is uh, a digital threats to democracy program where we are analyzing um, the ways in which uh, the media and the ability to disseminate information um, has transformed our democracies across the world. And this is true not just in the United States, but in a country like Liberia, which has one of the poorest countries in the world, you still have uh, people getting their news about what's happening in their own country from Facebook uh, on their phones. And so, you know, if that information is real, and if that information is accurate, it can be a great empowering tool to ensure that there's accountability on the part of the government. If it's disinformation and if it is uh, skewed information or if it is information that incites violence or, or, or other you know, enhances uh, differences, then it can be a real problem and it can really undermine sort of the democratic principles that we've all been talking about. So I, I think that you know, in this country, there are media outlets that do a great job. Uh, there are also media outlets that are obviously uh, doing a terrible job uh, and that are, that, are, that are sending and distributing misinformation. So the, the key, I think, uh, for handling the media in this day and age, media broadly speaking, is educating our citizens for how we consume information. What is it that we're looking at? How can we think critically about you know, whether we are, whether the information that we're getting is, is reliable, whether it's accurate, whether it, whether it has the different kinds of biases that are there um, or not. And, and so if, if we can educate citizens in that way, um, and if we can sort of tackle the, uh, the, the, the ways in which people can manipulate uh, the media, then I think it's gonna be really important. But that is a, that is a huge issue for us. I mean, and it's a huge issue in this country, but I think people underrate the extent to which it's a huge issue throughout the world, even in, in some of the poorest countries in the world where you and I don't spend too much time looking at, at the Liberian media, but you would be amazed that they are confronting many of the same issues that we're confronting in this country. Interesting. Today, especially given current events, mental health is a growing issue, not only in the developing world, but also here in the United States. Can you please speak to the work of the Carter Center in the area of mental health? Sure, thank you so much for this question. Um, in fact, one of the things that's happening this year is the Carter Center is gonna celebrate uh, 50 years of my grandmother, Rosalind Carter's activism on mental uh, health. And when she, uh, my grandfather became governor of Georgia in 1970, 
um, she, uh, many, many years before very many other people were talking about it, was striving to ensure that we treat mental health uh, in the similar way that we treat what we would call physical health. Um, and, you know, she has fought for many years and advocated for parity among insurance, for example, for mental health issues, uh, for, for the ability to take leave um, from a job for mental health issues that would be at parity with, with physical issues um, and to really treat it and also sort of fundamentally to reduce the stigma. And that stigma associated with mental illness um, is one that we have fought in a number of ways. We have a, a journalism fellowship to tie into your last question, Murad. Um, that tries to help educate journalists about how to deliver information on mental illness, um, because that's one of the ways as we as in the, in the public consume information that, that we can either increase or reduce the stigma associated with mental illness. So we've done that kind of advocacy in the United States and that kind of work with journalists in the United States. But we've also expanded that into the, many of the other countries that we work, including um, in Liberia and including um, in, in Ethiopia and other places where the Carter Center has had a mental health training uh, in Liberia, which was beset with a civil war for many, many years. The, the level of, of mental health issues was extreme for children and others. Um, and they had one single uh, psychiatrist in the entire country. And the Carter Center put a program together that we're now expanding to other countries that um, trained uh, mental health clinicians to be able to have to just have conversations with people to identify uh, the kind of treatable mental illness that may exist uh, and to begin the process of, of healing some of these communities, both uh, mentally and physically. So it's it's an important part of our work. Uh, and it's certainly an important part of my grandmother's legacy. Uh, and one, frankly, and if you think about the last 50 years, uh, we have come an enormously long way uh, towards dealing with stigma and towards providing parity. But there are many parts of the world, as with other issues, that are still lagging behind. But it's, it's a great moment. And especially right now when we're all sitting alone in our homes, uh, it's one that we all need to be aware of. In the developing world, what are some of the most common mental illnesses that you all are, are finding and having to help prevent? Or, or no, I mean, it, it, it's it, the same issues arise there that arise here, right? You have sort of the serious set of mental illness that you would have anywhere. Um, but the difference is, is when you're when you're not treating depression, uh, when you're not treating schizophrenia, when you're not treating those issues at all uh, or uh, more. Um, more severely when you're treating uh, someone who has schizophrenia by putting them in the closet, literally, uh, by locking them in a different house, by uh, you know, doing the kinds of things that, that, uh, that occur in countries where there's lack of education, where there's an extreme stigma with respect to mental illness. Um, you know, those issues are, are, are really serious in, 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 the, in sort of the less resource or developing countries. Um, but in addition, in a place like Liberia, there's just so much PTSD. There's so many, um, there's so many uh, traumatic experiences that kids have had throughout their lives in conflict zones and in other places and in other ways uh, that it's just important to, to be able to confront those issues as you see them. And then, and then finally, frankly, um, you know, you've, you've got so many of these uh, underlying mental health issues that end up being treated, um, you know, the self-treated with, with drugs and, and other substance abuse disorders that, you know, the, the, we've been able to, to talk through some of these different issues and to provide communities with resources to confront them. But really, this is an area in which what we deal with in Atlanta, uh, Murad, where you and I both are, um, is not that different than what we would deal with in, in Monrovia, uh, you know, Liberia. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, and people are people. That's that's one of the things that is just true all over the world. It goes back to where we started with, you know, the divinity in all of us. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we have spoken briefly about peace, hope, and disease. At Brown University's commencement ceremony in 1996, His Highness the Aga Khan stated, the right to hope is the most powerful human motivation I know. How do you see the role of hope in fighting disease, specifically the current one we are grappling with today? I, I think, you know, I might have mentioned it before, but one of the one of the key aspects of being a, a free human is the idea that if you make a decision, it will make a difference, at least in your own life. You have enough power to change what it is that you're going to do. And people who are without hope, have really don't don't have that set of beliefs. They believe that the world is going to happen to them no matter what, uh, and that there's no reason for them necessarily to engage in some of those issues that that we, they would otherwise engage in. And, and I think 
we, we sometimes get frustrated by all of these powerful things acting on us uh, that make it more difficult for us to discern the way in which we can act out into the world. Um, but to me, that idea of hope, as, we, as I mentioned earlier today, you know, um, when talking about guinea worm eradication, you know, my, let, me, let me start here. My, my grandparents are from a tiny village in South Georgia. You know, my, they, there are 600 people that live in Plains. It's not near any road. There's no reason for anyone to go there. When my grandfather grew up there, you know, people grew their own food at, at their place um, where they lived, you know, on, on small farms. And so when, when he, this man from a 600 person village who grew up to change the world, to bring, you know, peace in, in the Middle East in, between Israel and Egypt to, you know, preserve more land than any other uh, president in the history of the world, you know, to do all of these incredible things that, that he has been able to do, hopefully eradicate the second disease ever eradicated from the face of the earth. When he goes into a tiny village in Mali and sees, well, these 600 people, most of them don't have shoes, et cetera. He does not see that. Uh, he sees that as a place that he recognizes. I know someone from a 600 person community. I know someone who grew up in a place like this where they were growing their own food, where they were doing the, the things that, that he did as a child. And he sees that those folks have real power. And so when, when, when we've eradicated guinea worm disease, it has not been with any medicine. It will have been with education. It, it's a waterborne disease. And if you filter your water, you don't get it anymore. And as I mentioned, what that requires is for each community to have somebody in that community um, to be there to, to educate their friends, to, to, to tell people how to do it. And they've got to have a belief in themselves and in their community that this community can er eliminate this disease. And as I said before, in every single one of those villages in Nigeria and throughout the West, the, 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 the so part of sub-Saharan Africa where guinea worm used to exist, that disease is gone. There's only six people that got it last year. And it, it, in every one of those places, it was eliminated by people in that community where my grandparents and the Carter Center saw that they had real power to transform that community. And then we watched them do it. I mean, those are the people who eradicated the disease. And that just to me is an example of as we confront these giant problems, what we have to confront them with is an understanding that each of us have the ability to make a change and can and can do and, and affect the way our communities and the others around us operate. And you know, this coronavirus is one of those examples. I mean, we know that one of the best ways to to prevent the spread is for us to take individual action. That means that we're not going to super spreader events, that we are, you know, taking care of our own selves, that we are making sure that we're being diligent, et cetera. And that belief that we can make that change is what's going to help us as communities do it. And, and groups like this that bring people together and help support them in their uh, sort of personal endeavors are exactly the kind of groups that, that I think change the world. And that's frankly the only thing that's ever changed the world, as one of the great quotes says. So anyway, that, that's the hope and disease next for me. So perhaps educating leads to intellectual understanding, which leads to sort of logically extrapolating that there's hope in a, in a situation. Is that fair to say? Sure. I mean, you know, if you give people tools, yeah. you know, people will believe that they can make a difference. I think, I, think, I think people generally believe that. I think there's certainly people everywhere who have that spark that, hey, you know, I, I look and I see an injustice or I see something that's bad. I want to fix it. You know, that is a, that is a human activity to yeah. believe you can better your community. And I think when you give people resources and tools and show them how, then they do it. I think you have a visitor behind you. Yeah, it's my dog. His name's Johnny. <laughs> um, okay. You're, you're, thank you for that, Jason. That was really good. Um, your, your grandfather, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, delivered his Nobel lecture after receiving the 2002 Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway. He said, we can choose to alleviate suffering. We can choose to work together for peace. We can make these changes and we must. What did he mean by that? I think it's similar to what we've been talking about or what almost what we just said is that everybody has a choice for how they're gonna live their life. And you know, when I was a kid, the church that I grew up in, it had a, um, there was a memorial plaque on the wall from a woman who had died a long time ago and it had said, she has done what she could. And when I was a kid, I read that and I thought it was kind of a put down, like, well, I mean, you know, she did what she could. But then 
if you think about it, and you know, you and I have talked about this, Marad, you think about the opportunities that we have in our lives. How many of us can really say we've done everything we could? It's a, it's a huge goal to say that I spent my time here doing as much as I can. And that's, that's my grandfather's point. We have the ability to do these things. And you can make a choice to do them or not. But if you aren't making that choice, if you're not doing what you can, um, then in his view, um, you know, I, I would say that you're, 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 you're wasting the, the, the great gift that you've been given. That's a strong reminder for all of us. Thank you. And to that point, you know, we have a very large, um, you know, youth population in our community, and many of them would be excited to support the work of the Carter Center. Um, perhaps you can give us uh, an overview of the internships or mm -hmm. fellowship opportunities available um, at, at the center. Yeah, so th thanks for asking that question. Um, you know, I, I actually began my Carter Center career as a Carter Center intern in 1990. Five, I think it was, um, which all of a sudden was a lot longer ago than it used to be. But in any event, um, the Carter Center's internship program, we've had interns from hundreds of countries. Uh, we have, uh, and they come to either to Atlanta this year, they're, they're doing it virtually, but they participate uh, in, in the various different aspects of the, of the center's program. Most of them are college students who are doing that either as a semester or during the summer. Some of them are for some of the internships post postgraduate students. But college students and, and postgrads who are interested in the work uh, can definitely apply to be a Carter Center intern, and, and it, it, it generally gets um, gets great uh, awards for being a very hands-on internship. In other words, we, we don't have people making copies at all. We have people engaging in uh, the, the the reviews of this, the crucial issues that we're confronting, and really participating in the programs. And um, you know, we we spend a lot of time with with interns. In fact, the last time I was in. Uh, Guyana uh, for their election. We had two Carter Center interns there, um, you know, doing a host of things that that were incredibly enriching for them, I'm sure. And I know they've accompanied me to Liberia and, and a variety of other places um, as well. So it's a, it's a good program and, and it, you can do peace stuff and you can do health stuff uh, for those college uh, and post-grad students out there. Excellent. Well, hopefully we'll get your application numbers up as a result of this. I'd like that. It would certainly be good to have a crop of Ismaili interns. Maybe a whole. Maybe we could fill the whole uh, class. But yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, Jason, thank you so much. I'm honored to be affiliated with you and the and the Carter Center. And um, you know, if there's anything that we can do to support you, please let us know. Um, this concludes our programming. Do you have any final thoughts or comments that you'd like to share? Just, just to say thank you for having me uh, and to say that, you know, as, as we press forward as a, as a country and as a world, uh, the, the views and, um, and the, the perspectives of every community are really important. And the Ismaili community is one that has uh, a lot of resources, a lot of strength, a lot of power, a lot of intellect. Uh, and it's one that I think everybody would benefit from hearing uh, as much uh, from you as we can. So I'm honored to be here and I look forward to um, watching the engagement of this community um, more and more and more. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Jason. Really appreciate it. See you soon. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Jason and Murad, for an enlightening session. Uh, to the listeners, I hope you enjoy the session as much as I have. We're living in some challenging times never experienced before in this, by this generation. While we hope things will get better, and yes, hope we must have, the world as we know will change. While uncertainty remains, we can replace fear with hope and together work towards building a better future. On behalf of the Smiley Jamal Kanan Center, thank you for joining.